Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And there is no better month that we do that than February. I think a lot of our longtime teacher partners will know we spend the entire month of February only showcasing incredible women in science and exploration from across the world. Uh, in addition to 35 live broadcasts throughout the month, uh, this month, uh, we also did our epic Women Blaze trails festival so i'll bring up a banner for this uh, right now on the screen we did 50 programs in three days everything from astronauts to cave divers deep sea biologists to serengeti all-stars it was just an incredible celebration of some amazing people and places from around the globe you can check out all those talks at the website or on our youtube channel today we are diving in with a very special presenter I've wanted her on this broadcast for four years, but she's been spending so much time saving the planet and doing such incredible work that she couldn't quite make it. So, thrill for me personally, hopefully for you guys too. We are joined live in Toronto, where I am too, by Dr. Emily Darling, and she is a coral reef biologist with the Wildlife Conservation Society. She has gone all over this planet in pursuit of one of the most beautiful and amazing ecosystems on this planet in the whole world. Um, and we're going to learn a little bit today about some of the places she's gone, some of the threats facing quarries, and what people are doing to protect them. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Darling, and take us away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an amazing introduction. Thank you so much, Jesse, and thank you so much, everyone who decided to come along today and dive with me uh, into one of the places that I find to be the most fascinating and most cool on our planet. So it's true what Jesse said. I am a coral reef biologist, and that means I get to spend a lot of my time doing this, breathing compressed air, being weightless under the surface of the ocean, and studying the health of coral reefs around the world. And so if there's one thing I want you to take away today, it's that there are still healthy coral reefs left, and there's still a lot of things we can do to keep it that way. So, but, you know, coral reefs, before we get too carried away, what is a coral reef? I get a lot of questions. Is it a rock? Is it a plant? Is it like some animal? Is it a combination of all of them? What is it? So I prepared a little animation I'm very proud of in PowerPoint. Imagine your favorite jellyfish. A coral is very closely related to a jellyfish. Now let's shrink this jellyfish down and let's actually shrink it down even further and let's turn it upside down. Okay, we're getting really close to a coral now. This is in fact a coral animal. It's a cnidarian, which means it has stinging cells and it's a relative of a jellyfish. But the really cool thing about corals is that they live together in colonies. So a coral colony is just a whole bunch of upside down jellyfish living together. And when they live together, um, well, as a coral, they secrete a, a, a skeleton of calcium carbonate or of limestone. And that's what creates these remarkable structures called coral reefs. So a coral reef is really just a whole bunch of coral colonies um, in you know, certain parts of the ocean that have enough light, where the temperature is warm enough, where the water is clear enough. Usually this is in bands around the equator of our planet. And that's a coral reef. So if anyone asks you, it's not a rock. It's not a plant, it's not an animal, it's actually kind of a combination of all three. It has a hard skeleton of limestone, so kind of like a rock, um, and it is an animal, my upside down jellyfish, and it also has this remarkable symbiosis with a plant, a tiny zooxanthellate algae that lives in the tissue of the coral. So really, it's a good trivia question because it's one of the only things on our planet that's both a plant, an animal, and a mineral. Pro tip. Okay, but you know, one of the really cool things about coral reefs is not just that, you know, they're a great trivia question, but they support some of the most, you know, biodiverse communities of nature on our planet. And so coral reefs provide a structure for a lot of fish on a reef. You can see some of those fishes here, like this red grouper or these butterfly fish. And in fact, coral reefs are home to one quarter of all of the species of life in our oceans, despite occupying just a small fraction of space uh, on our planet. And in fact, some of our favorite friends indeed uh, from Finding Nemo, my of course favorite movie, um, also live on coral reefs. Okay, 
But, you know, back to the science. So how do scientists study coral reefs? Well, when I'm very, very lucky, this is my above water office. This is a picture from Kalambonger Island in the Solomon Islands, which is a place you'll see coming up a little more in this talk. It's a chain of islands that is near Australia and Papua New Guinea in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So what you see here is our uh, scientific station when we finish diving for the day and we come out of the water with our information and our notes from underwater paper that we've recorded by pencil on clipboards. Um, we bring that back to our computers and we enter that in uh, to learn about the health of coral reefs. So this is one of my favorite places because there's no electricity, there's no running water, and there's no Wi-Fi and there's no emails. Um, but, you know, being able to, to be in these places means that we're working very closely with local communities. And I think that's one really important part of coral reef science is that a big part of my job is working with local communities. Um, this is a photo I took from Fiji during a traditional fisheries harvest. Um, and this is working with communities on Coral Island who have been managing their coral reef fisheries for thousands of years using traditional governing practices. Um, and so I think it's really important to remember that coral reef conservation is a lot about people. And that's because more than 500 million people around the planet rely on coral reefs. And that's for a whole bunch of really important things either from jobs, from the fisheries that coral reefs have, or from tourism, from people visiting the reefs. Healthy coral reefs provide a natural shoreline buffer to protect communities from storms. Having access to fish is also a really important part of a healthy diet for many people around the world who rely on coral reefs for nutrition and food security. And like I mentioned, it's also a very important part of culture and traditions. Um, and so that's one of the things that I find the most fascinating about coral reefs is that you're always thinking about these very complex issues of people and nature and change and, and how are we all going to kind of, you know, get through that together. Um, so one of the things that we're most worried about with coral reefs, I'm sure a lot of you have heard kind of doom and gloom stories about coral reefs. And that's that's true. And that's because coral reefs are changing. So what I want to show you now is a video clip I just received from my colleagues in the Solomon Islands. Um, these are the same reefs that you saw those pictures of um, earlier in the talk. Um, and this is what the reefs look like right now. And they're bleaching from climate change. Oh, my video. We were just working. Here we go. There we go. Oh. Jesse, can you see the video? It's thinking about it. It did. It worked five minutes ago in test. <laughs> Try pressing play one more time. See what happens. Oh. Okay. Um, there has to be something goes wrong with every video call. Otherwise, it's no fun. Let's oh, see. goodness. All right. Let me try. Let's, let's see. It really was just working. It was. Let's try this. Worst, it worst was. case. There's Does it work? We all saw it. There we go. Take three. Come on. Oh, no. No, that's okay. We'll send it to classes later. So if you can send it to me later, I'll get it okay. to the class and make sure everyone can watch it. All right. That sounds good. Can't wait. Okay. Well, um, carrying on. So what you would have seen about now? No, I got nothing. Okay. Let's, so you're still seeing my screen and, and oh, there we go. There okay. We go. Well, what you would be seeing... Are we, we're back and we're good? We're back and we're good. Okay. So what you would be seeing in this video is all of the corals on this reef turning white. And so that's a sign of very stressed corals that are in fact starving to death because that symbiosis I told you about between the plants and the animals, that broke down that those colorful plants, the zooxanthellate algae, they have, it has become too stressful, too hot for them to live with the coral. They leave into the water column and the coral is left white and bleached. And so basically the coral is starving to death. 
So coral bleaching is caused by ocean heat waves. Corals live at the threshold of you know, their temperature tolerance. And so any hotter it gets in the, in the summers or in the winters, really in both because of climate change, um, can cause this mass coral bleaching. Um, and so that is, is what we're really worried about. And as a scientist, I am seeing reefs change because of climate change. This causes coral bleaching. And part of my job as a scientist is to try to track and measure coral bleaching around the world, find places that are maybe bleaching less, and try to understand why that is. And I think I saw some questions about that early on, so I'm happy to tackle that soon. OK, so with too much bleaching, scientists are really worried that coral reefs are going to look like this in the future. We know that half of the world's coral reefs are gone. And we're worried that 90% of coral reefs may be lost within the next few decades to climate change. But I want to tell you that that's not all doom and gloom. That's based on, on modeling. And we're updating and, and you know learning new things about the models every day with the science that we're doing. And one of the things that's been really surprising, you know, especially to models that predict a lot of this doom and gloom, is that there are still healthy coral reefs on, on our planet. And so as a coral reef scientist, part of my job is to help train and connect scientists around the world to undertake scientific surveys to find the reefs that look like this and understand why they're still there. So I've seen them, they're out there, um, and there is still so much hope for coral reefs, just like there is for other ecosystems across our planet. So I know we all wanted to be marine biologists when we grow up, and so I wanted to take you to the field, and I'm a little worried this next video isn't going to work either, but let me try to tell you a little bit more about my job, and if not, I will answer questions later. Not looking good, is it? Oh, such a bummer. bummer. All right, we will send you this one too. Yes, we will. Oh, oh okay. well. Fine. I'm moving on unhappily. Okay, so what does it look like to be a coral reef scientist underwater? Well, it's actually, other than wearing scuba gear, which you can see here, which has um, a mouthpiece to breathe air and a buoyancy control jacket to control where I am in the water column, fins to help me swim. Um, this is, that would be what I'm wearing. The picture you're seeing here is actually Dr. Nyawira Mutiga, who is one of the leading marine biologists in the world. And she grew up studying the coral reefs of Kenya and Tanzania, where she's from. And so what I want to do is show you what it looks like when she goes underwater to survey coral reefs. She um, takes down underwater slates, which you can see here. These are basically pieces of plastic where we've, with rulers and permanent markers, we've recorded all the different types of fish and corals we expect to see underwater. We then attach our pencils to the slates and we're able to mark down and count the different corals and fishes that we've seen. So a lot of people ask, how do you write underwater or how do you measure and, and record coral reefs? And it's through using very low tech, <laughs> uh, you know, very low tech means like this. Um, but, you know, one of the things I've been really excited about and that you'll see in the videos that we send is that once we get back to the surface, we're able to use some of the most cutting edge technology to then take um, our underwater surveys and put them into the cloud. So um, use cutting edge web applications to, you know, very quickly enter our data check and clean it, and then push it up to a global community of other scientists who are using similar methods. And by comparing these types of surveys all around the world with our uh, online technology that we call Mermaid, we're able to find out where are the healthy coral reefs around the planet? Where are fish doing the best and why? And what are the types of things that local communities, governments, um, citizens, you know, what are the types of things that we can all do to make sure that coral reefs stay healthy like that. So I wanted to tell you two stories about some of the places where I work, about the types of threats they face and the types of management that they're using to tackle those threats and make sure that coral reefs stay healthy. So here in Fiji, um, at, here in Fiji, some of the top threats to coral reefs are actual, actually water pollution. So when there is logging or pig farms or agriculture on land, any nutrients or sediment or dirt that sort of happens you know, on land that can run off onto coral reefs. 
So coral reefs are coastal ecosystems, which means they're right on the margin between land and water. They're often very shallow. You can see here a, a woman from a local community um, fishing on the reef. Um, so they're very near, you know, where, where activities, our activities on land are happening. And so because corals are so sensitive, um, not just to temperature, but also to things like too many nutrients, which then allow these um, macroalgae to grow and, and outcompete the corals, or also to sediments, uh, which can just smother and choke our little upside down jellyfish so that they can't breathe anymore. So in Fiji, um, our conservation teams are working with local communities to really clean up the water that is moving from the land into the ocean for coral reefs. This is really exciting because it's considering a one health approach to coral reefs, where it's not just the corals and the biodiversity that matters, it's also the health of the people who are living right next to the coral reefs. So having healthier water and cleaner water is obviously really good for people too. What people in Fiji noticed was that during flooding events, uh, there'd be a lot of typhoid and dengue and leptospirosis, so diseases that would make people really sick. But by cleaning up um, you know, the water, having access to cleaner water, thinking about better practices around rivers on land, then not only are you cleaning up the water to help coral reefs survive and grow, but you also have healthier people. So these very integrated connections between people and coral reefs are so crucial to coral reef conservation, as you heard before. Um, another story of a place I work, and that's very dear to my heart, where I lived for six years, is here in coastal East Africa in Kenya. Um, so here, coral reefs are uh, in a very important habitat for small scale fishing. So you can see here some local community members going out in a traditional dhow. So it'd be a small wooden sailing vessel. Um, they'll go into the lagoons of, with coral reefs and fish using traps or nets or spear guns to bring home uh, their daily catch. And that daily catch is really important because it can be one of the only ways that they um, either have food for their families um, or also sell that catch to local traders or fish markets and then have food and then have money to not only buy other food for their family, but also to send their kids to school. So fishing is an incredibly important livelihood uh, for many people around the world and especially here in Kenya. So one of the threats to uh, coral reefs and coral reef fisheries in Kenya is simply too many people out fishing um, and, to, and using destructive gears. So gears that catch too many fish or gears that have you know, nets that have very small mesh sizes where baby fish are caught. And so when you catch baby fish in a fishery, your baby fish can't grow to be adult fish to then make more baby fish. So it becomes a very unsustainable or exploited fishery. Um, but there's really good news because we know a lot about sustainable fisheries management. So that would be things like making that mesh size bigger to allow the baby fish to survive and, you know, grow and reproduce. And so what we've been doing at the Wildlife Conservation Society in Kenya is working for over 30 years with county governments, with local fishing groups, um, with other, you know, various agencies and partners um, to give local fishermen the evidence they need to make decisions about their fisheries. So on the right here, you see an example of a fishers forum. And this is an opportunity for hundreds of fishers to come together from the North Coast, from the South Coast, and even as far away as into Tanzania. They come together for the day and they learn about the latest science around the coral reef fishery. And they talk to each other about different options that they can take to make sure that their fishery is, is as sustainable as possible into the future. So again, the sustainability issue is combining people and nature. When you have more fish on a reef, then those fish are able to pr provide really important functions to the corals. So fish graze algae and they create space so that baby corals can come in and settle on a reef and then grow into big corals. Um, and when you have more fish on a reef, you also have more fish for the fishery. And so that's good for people. So again, coral reefs are very connected through people and nature and being able to give local communities who make decisions the best science and evidence uh, has been a really satisfying part of my job. 
Okay, so what I told you a little bit about was this thing called Mermaid, um, and uh, that'll be sh shown in one of the videos that you'll see soon. But one of my big passions of being a coral reef scientist is not just going underwater, but being able to work with incredible scientists like Yashika Nand, who you see here from Fiji, like Dr. Nyuera Mutiga from Kenya, and by creating tools like Mermaid, we're trying to connect their stories and their data around the world. Um, and it's really important that we bring these data together because it can tell us new things and more hopeful things about coral reefs. For example, um, recently we published one of the largest studies on coral reefs in the world, where over 100 monitoring scientists, including Yash and Nyuera, like you just saw earlier, they sent in a lot of their unpublished surveys and they sent them to me and I was able to combine them and synthesize them with studies from people you know, across the Indian and Pacific oceans. So every yellow dot you see here is a scientist who went underwater with their slates and their pencils and recorded the health of coral reefs. Um, they had never been put together in this way before. Um, they would have stayed in their own little yellow circles. But by bringing them together, we were able to find something really important. We found that there are over 450 reefs in 22 countries across the Indian and Pacific Oceans that are still very healthy and functioning. And more importantly, they seem to be in these pockets of climate refuge. So they aren't heating up as fast as other reefs nearby. So that is really hopeful because it suggests that we can have a network of functioning coral reefs around the world and we can pair that with what we know about local management, about having more sustainable fisheries, about cleaning up the water that coral reefs live in, and that also has benefits for people like having more fish to feed their families, to pay for their kids to go to school, and to not get sick from diseases from dirty water. Okay. So saving coral reefs, unlike probably some of the um, uh, other stories you've heard from exploring by the seat of your pants, is not rocket science. It's actually really straightforward. We need to find healthy coral reefs. We need to work with local partners and communities on the ground um, to you know, identify top threats, to mitigate those threats appropriately, and ultimately have coral reefs that are healthy for both people and nature. So I really want to let you know that there is still time to save coral reefs. And there are lots of people around the world who are working on that. But we want to recruit you too. <laughs> Being a field biologist has been one of the most coolest things I've ever done in my life. Being able to see coral reefs or travel to other countries, work with people around the world. Um, and so science has taken me to places I never would have imagined. Um, and field biology is, you know, really different than, you know, chemistry or physics or maybe some of the exercises in school that you're not super jazzed about. Um, but it can take you into really remarkable places where you solve problems, you work with other people and you try to leave the world a better place. So I hope you'll all consider field biology in the future. Um, so there is still time to save coral reefs. Um, and of course, that's not only for the biodiversity of nature on our planet, but it's also for future generations, like this kid in the Solomon Islands, who I really hope gets to grow up and not only go to a great school and make great choices about how they want to live their life, but also have healthy coral reefs that they can depend on for themselves and their family. And so with more people caring about coral reefs, not just about the biodiversity and the nature, but also the people who depend on them, I, and I hope like you, are really hopeful for the future. So I'd like to stop there and thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take questions. And I'm so sorry those videos didn't work out. I can't wait to send you those links. That thank you. Quite all right, Emily, that was an amazing presentation. If you want to come out of screen share so you can see us have a bit of a conversation, go for it. Um, I want to note uh, for our classes live, we've got seven groups live, at least four more on YouTube. So it's like 250 plus kids from across the continent. Welcome into all of you guys uh, for this really special presentation today. And before we dive in with questions, I really want to note this for our classes. You guys got a chance to see Emily's adventures all over the world today. You got to see how cool scuba diving can be. Every one of our classes that are live certainly are fit the bill for this. PADI, which is one of the leading certification groups for diving in the world, has a bubble maker program that you can start at eight years old. So from the time you're eight, you can start on the path to becoming a scuba diver and exploring more than two thirds of this planet. I could not encourage you guys to do anything else that will uh, increase your adventure quotient more than that. So do check out that program. It's some really, really cool stuff. All right, uh, Emily, let's dive in with Ms. Lozell's class. I know you guys have got to go in a few minutes. So I'm gonna bring in Ms. Lozell to kick us off with a question. Go for it. Uh 
Good afternoon, Emily. What, Hi there. We're from Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. I hope you know where that might be. Um, anyhow, um, one of my students- I sure do. To I'm just south of you in Toronto. Perfect, okay. Um, one of my students wanted to know, and I hope you can answer this, where do lionfish get their poison from? I don't know if you're able to answer that or not. Oh, that's a good question. Um, lionfish, um, I actually moonlit as a lionfish biologist to work with some friends in the Caribbean. Um, so I don't know lots about their poison, but I know enough to know that we were very careful not to touch their spines. Um, but likely they get their, well, they get their poison from their spines and it's a defense mechanism. And it means that other fish don't like to eat them. As of course, you know, not only do they have big spikes and they're bright red and orange, but then if you touch their spike, your hand is just going to swell up like a balloon. And that did in fact, um, happen to some of, some of my friends who were working with them for many, many years and said it was very painful and you have to pour like kettles of boiling water over your hand. And then it eventually gets better in a couple of days. But um, when we think about where animals get their poison, um, it's usually through evolution. So at some point there was a lot, there was some ancestor of a lionfish um, who, you know, maybe a few spikes or, you know, some coloration. And there was probably a mutation that created poison in one of its, you know, created this poison. That ended up being a pretty good life choice for that lionfish because it didn't get eaten. And probably other lionfish who didn't have that mutation did get eaten. So as I'm sure, you know, how you're, what you're all seeing through the process of natural selection over, you know, many, many generations. Now, all of those lionfish um, have that, had that type of poison. Um, lionfish and poison are really an important conservation story because um, they have invaded the Caribbean. So they're natural to the Indo-Pacific. But in the Caribbean, they uh, accidentally were released from an aquarium in Florida during a hurricane. And now they have just completely taken over the Caribbean. And because of that poison, and also because they don't have any natural predators, they're doing a really good job at sucking up all of the little fish and baby fish in the Caribbean. And so um, this has been a big problem and conservation has responded. So dive shops uh, have organized lionfish derbies where you go out with your spear gun and you only hunt lionfish. And your goal is to just completely clear them off the reef. That's been working really well. And in fact, we're seeing lionfish being less of a problem in the Caribbean, in part because, you know, obviously because of conservation. Um, but, you know, that's all related to their poison in their spines, too. Yeah. Cool question, Ms. Liz. Also, thank you guys so, so much for that. And of course, we know where Sudbury is. Sudbury is great. We actually had a really cool program about Sudbury just last month. And we've got another one, uh, same people, coming up early March. So get ready for that as well. Um, I want to go to our 5-2 Eco Club, Mr. Breeze class. Uh, if you guys have a question for us, just unmute that mic and come on in. I know you're doing other things at the same time. So show up in the chat and we'll see. How about I come to you guys in just a minute? We're going to go to Miss Sims class. I know you guys had a few tech difficulties, but if you want to unmute your mic, we can try and take a question live, and I have it in the chat if not. Hey, Miss Sims. Hey, there you are. <laughs> Welcome in. Um, do you want me to just share it from the chat? Does that work for you guys? Okay, let's do that. So their first question, um, is the Canadian government helping mm -hmm. coral reefs in any way, Emily? Oh, you're in. Great question. Yes, Very so I would say that yes. The Go, go the for Canadian it, government is <laughs> the Canadian government is helping coral reefs in part through funding coral reef scientists um, and like myself and other colleagues. So a key part of helping coral reefs is understanding what makes them tick how to save them better. So funding our, you know, Canada's science and research more broadly than just the things that live in Canada, but, you know, the things that live globally can be really important. Um, but also, you know, Canada's commitment to um, foreign aid can contribute to things like when communities have more sustainable fisheries or have more access to clean water, and that can have, you know, more indirect um, but cascading effects to coral reefs. Um, so good question. I have to think a little more about a tougher answer to that, but I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of um, how the Canadian government is helping coral reefs. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, we're going to head to London, Ontario, Mr. Patrick's class. If you guys have a question for us, come on in, uh, unmute that mic, and you are good to go. Hello, Mr. Patrick. Hello. 
<laughs> How do coral reefs get their coloration? Coral reefs get their colors from those tiny symbiotic algae that are called zooxanthellae that live in their tissues. And so that's what gives them their pinks, their blues, their purples, their oranges, their yellows. All those colors are because of the algae that live in their tissues. Um, those algae have their, their colors because of how they photosynthesize from the sun. They need pigments to be able to capture that sunlight and turn it into food. So a coral itself is just a kind of translucent white animal and we know that because of coral bleaching. So when corals bleach and turn white because their ocean temperatures got too hot, it's because their algae have left the coral and the algae took their color with them. Great question, guys. I was wondering how long it was going to take to get that one in. Um, Mr. Breeze uh, Eco Club, <laughs> if you guys want to bring on your camera and let me know that you're there, I will come to you in a minute. But we are going to go to Mr. H's class. They're joining us in Waterloo. So, Mr. H, if you want to unmute your mic and share one on behalf of your class, go for it. Sure. Um, one, of my one of my students in my class, Logan, had a question. Um, I'm not sure if you know this offhand, uh, but he had another question as well. Do you know how many square? Yeah, square yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you guys hear me? I believe you're muted. No, we're good. We can hear you, Mr. H. Oh, I'm muted to my class. They're telling me I'm muted, but you guys, I'm not muted to you guys. Um, do you know how many square kilometers of coral reefs there are in the world? Or is that kind of too big of a, of a uh, question? Luckily, I am very fast at doing things. And the answer is 284,300 square kilometers of coral reefs. Now, that probably doesn't mean very much to me. Maybe it means a lot to you. But what is fascinating about coral reefs is that they occupy a small fraction of our planet and an even smaller fraction of the world's oceans, which not a lot of part of, big part of our planet. So what's cool about coral reefs is how important they are for people and for biodiversity, despite occupying such a small fraction of our planet. And so really they have disproportionate benefits. And that's why it's so important to try to think about how do we get these ecosystems through climate change so that they continue can continue supporting our planet and the people who live on it. So small amount, like globally, but the actual answer is like 284,300 square kilometers. Excellent. Great question, Mr. H. And great Googling, Emily. That was awesome. Um, we're going to go to our eco club. So I know you guys can't turn on your camera, but I'm going to bring you into the broadcast. You should be able to just unmute your mic and share from there. You've got two streams in the broadcast right now. So, oh, there we go. The other one. We'll go to the other one. Hi there. <laughs> Hello. Okay. So uh, one of my classmates have a question. Uh, her question is, by what time do you think the reefs will flourish again? The flourish again with lots of work. Ooh. <gasps> Great question. Uh, well, you know, in good news, there are reefs flourishing right now. And so people are definitely working hard to, to keep it that way, making sure they have clean water, making sure they have enough fish. Um, but, you know, there are lots of healthy reefs still on our planet. And so the decisions that, that we make, you know, as a global community um, are really important to make sure coral reefs stay that way. I'm maybe stepping back and from another angle on that question, we can make sure that all reefs flourish um, by really making sure we tackle climate change. So if our planet keeps heating up and if our oceans keep heating up on the trajectory they are now, a lot more coral reefs are going to struggle to, to stay alive and to be healthy. And so, you know, our coral reefs are going to look really different on our planet. And I don't, I want to make sure that coral reefs flourish the same way that you do. And so in good news, there are very healthy coral reefs still in in places on our planet but to make sure that all coral reefs and all people have a chance to depend on those coral reefs we really have to work on climate change and making a transition to more wind energy or tidal wave energy or you know solar energy there are so many other ways that we can power our planet other than burning fossil fuels and that's going to be a hard transition but it's a really important one we have to make to ensure that coral reefs and all the other biodiversity on our planet has the best chance of success. Great question. Thank you. Great question and great answer. So thank you so much for that, Emily. 
Um, we're going to go back with our live, our, our two last uh, live classes in our groups and then take a few from YouTube before diving back in. So Miss Hopkins class, grade five is joining us in London. If you want to unmute your mic and come on in, you're good to go. Hi there. Uh, thanks so much for taking us. Um, our grade five virtual classroom would like to know what is the most, this is kind of a side question, but what is the most exotic fish in your opinion? Ooh, the most exotic. Uh, I, ooh, I can demonstrate. I really like manta rays and eagle rays. I don't know if you can see my t-shirt, but um, they are in fact a fish. I mean, kind of big picture fish. Um, they're a shark and a ray, or maybe I'll just expand fish to be like anything that's on a coral reef. Um, but I really love seeing manta ray or eagle rays underwater. They just glide along the reef, just swooping their arms, their tail just like shimmers out behind them. And it's amazing that they, you know, they never scratch their belly on a reef because corals are sharp and have those stinging cells, but they just swoop and glide and move over a reef. Um, and that's one of the uh, most remarkable things I've been lucky enough to see on a coral reef. There's a few places in the world where you can go to see mantas and pretty much universally, every time we have a scientist on, they're one of their favorite creatures in the world. They're certainly one of my favorite creatures in the world. So do check out manta rays if you haven't seen them uh, before. And eagle rays actually at Ripley's Aquarium of Canada. So if you're near Toronto, if you get a chance to go back when they open up again, they've got eagle rays, which are pretty cool. All right, let's go to Mr. Armstrong's class. They're joining us in Hanover. And then I'm going to take a few questions from YouTube. Mr. Armstrong, come on in. I've got a student who's an author and they would like to know where you can get uh, the underwater paper if she'd be able to write a, a book that's completely waterproof. And then another question is about the Great Barrier Reef. If um, it, it has been in deterioration or if it's, and if you can say the entire le length of it on the east coast of Australia is um improving or not potentially great question so the easy one is about the underwater as you might ask. so it's called right in the rain paper um and it's kind of just paper with a plastic covering and you can't write on it with pen but you can write on it with pencil so make sure you've got pencils and a pencil sharpener and you'll be able to write your book in no time um, you can get it from kind of any outdoor supply store, or I've even seen like right in the rain notebooks um, at local stationery stores. So they usually have a yellow cover. Um, I really look forward. Perfect. Thanks, Jesse. I really look forward to your underwater paper book. That's awesome. Um, okay, the Great Barrier Reef. That has been uh, in the in the headlines for the last couple of years. And that's because the Great Barrier Reef is, you know, the largest man, the largest natural structure that can be seen from space. Like you said, it extends from, you know, the northernmost tip of Australia all the way down the coast, or, you know, mostly to the coast of Australia. It's a massive structure. Um, we, you know, as scientists are very worried about what the Great Barrier Reef is telling us because it has experienced back to back to back bleaching um, in, I believe, 2015, 2016, 2017. So this, the Great Barrier Reef had, has never experienced bleaching like this before. Um, and so corals rely on long recovery times um, to grow their roots and grow their colony. Corals are slow growing animals. It takes those little upside down jellyfish a long time to like make their limestone skeleton and grow a whole roof. Um, that doesn't happen overnight. It, takes decades and generations. And so the problem with back to back to back bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef is that coral have not had a chance to grow and recover in between those bleaching events. So recovery windows are shrinking with climate change as more extreme events happen more frequently. And for corals, that's not giving them enough, enough time to recover. So in terms of where does the coral, the Great Barrier Reef stand now? There's hopeful, I mean, that's obviously worrying news that corals don't have enough time to recover, but there is hopeful news in that there are still pockets, again, of very healthy reefs. There's been some recent science showing that, you know, even with just a small percentage of, of 
reefs that are healthy in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, they can send baby corals out to a larger area on the on the Great Barrier Reef to help other reefs recover. Um, so it is it is definitely worrying. Um, in general, though, about your question, the northernmost, centralmost part of the Great Barrier Reef were the most affected by bleaching, and the more southernmost part of the Great Barrier Reef seemed to escape that bleaching. There's a couple reasons for that. One is during um, the during some of the first bleaching events, there was a lot of there was a big storm and cyclone that came through, and a lot of cloud cover. That cloud cover cooled down the water by mixing it up. And so that southernmost part of the reef didn't bleach as much. Um, also, it is just cooler, um, you know, in terms of temperatures towards the more um, higher latitudes. So corals just have a bit have a bit more um, chance to survive because it's, it's naturally cooler. Um, but the Great Barrier Reef is definitely a remarkable place. Um, and it's, you know, one reason it's remarkable is that because there are teams of scientists who are part of a national coral reef monitoring strategy. And so they take the pulse of the Great Barrier Reef's coral reefs every single year. Um, that's called the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And they publish reports online where you can go through and look at um, what's the health of the Great Barrier Reef and learn a lot more about how scientists um, measure that health. And also the really cool things they're looking to in the future, such as taking baby corals. So this is when corals are larvae in the water. They haven't attached to a reef yet, but they're just in the ocean. They can collect them, scoop them up, and then put them into aquariums where they simulate bleaching or they simulate temperature events or simulate the future climate. And they're basically trying to acclimatize baby corals to future temperatures. So giving them these shocks of heat early on to help make them more resilient in the future. And so the goal of the research is to try to understand how can you breed more resistant corals? And then how can you get those corals, those baby corals, onto a reef um, to maybe boost the natural resilience of reefs? So lots of really exciting things happening in Australia. And the Great Barrier Reef is a great place, and I hope you all get to go visit it. We certainly hope so too. It is an amazing place in the world. And again, for all our classes, if you go to our YouTube channel and type in Great Barrier Reef, Coral Reef Presentations, every talk we've ever done on the topic will be there. So if you wanna see more amazing imagery, learn more amazing science uh, than what Emily shared with us today, do check that out. Now we are nearing the end of the broadcast, which unfortunately means that we have time for about one more question. Um, what I'm gonna do though, for everyone who's keen to ask more, do check out Emily's website and her social media accounts uh, uh, at Emily S. Darling. Uh, she does amazing work there, shares more answers, and you can reach out and find uh, more answers to your questions because there's more than we can possibly take in one broadcast. But one that I wanna wrap up with, because I always like to take it in marine uh, programs, is about sharks. Miss Paloya's class, a few others on YouTube have mentioned, you know, when do you run into sharks? How how do you scuba dive when there are sharks? Are you afraid of sharks? What's the deal? <laughs> okay, what's the deal with sharks? Got it. Well, um, a wise friend once told me there are three sharks to be afraid of if you're scuba diving. That's a great white shark, the bull shark, and the tiger shark. Now, those are really big sharks. And so I have, I am trained as a coral biologist, which means I mostly have my head down in the reef and I'm identifying corals which don't move. But I have um, uh, extended my knowledge to those three sharks <laughs> so that if I ever look up and see one of those sharks, then I know that I may be to, you know, talk to my buddy in the water, you know, with some hand signals and figure out what we're going to do. Um, that said, you know, sharks are really not a threat to divers. Um, sharks are very comfortable in their underwater environment. They can see me bumbling along with my like scuba tank and, and my wetsuit. And, you know, I think I have never had a scary moment with a shark in my you know, hundreds of dives on the water. And more often than not, sharks are just really fun to swim with. And sometimes they even help me, you know, they double check my data. So one time in Fiji, um, we were diving off these four reefs where there's no dive shops or no tourists. So we had to bring our scuba gear and our air compressors and our generators all over on trucks on the ferry. And we're probably some of the first people who had put on scuba tanks and dove on this reef. 
And so patrolling the reef were these, um, you know, small white reef sharks. So they're not one of the three I'm scared of. Um, and, it's, and they're just, you know, beautiful sharks to see on a reef. And so it's funny because I, you know, staring my head into the coral, recording on my underwater paper. And then I just get the sense that somebody was, you know, something was nearby. And I turned my sh head and there was the white tip reef shark just like kind of sitting over my shoulder. And I really got the sense that, that they were like, what are you doing here? <laughs> but then I also got the sense they were like, that's not an ecropora. Double check that ID. Um, anyway, so I've always felt uh, incredibly welcome to coral reefs, either for the local communities who live there and depend and manage their reefs, um, and even to some of the, you know, smaller sharks that I'm very happy to see. Um, but, you know, we also make good decisions, just like you all do, I'm sure, day to day. One of our decisions is to dive, you know, in places where we think it's going to be safe. So, for example, on that same trip in Fiji, there's a big tuna processing plant. And so that tuna plant, um, you know, tuna are fished, come in, they're made into cans of tuna or fillets of tuna, and then all kind of the blood and guts and the other parts of the tuna they don't use, that's just flushed out into the ocean. Um, and so, you know, it eventually kind of clears up with the tides. Anyways, um, that's a great place not to go scuba diving because that's where there's going to be a lot of sharks coming in to check out this like, amazing story of like tuna bits. Um, so that's a place we don't dive, for example. So you, we make good decisions. We know uh, what, you know, what sharks to to avoid. And more more often than not, when we see a shark, it's just the most wonderful thing to see on a dive. Yeah. I'm so glad we could get that message in. And I want to stress for classes, again, sharks are something that cause a lot of fear in a lot of people when they think about the ocean. They really are amazing animals. They're beautiful animals. M many, many more people get knocked on the head by a coconut every year or have a vending machine fall on them than get attacked by sharks in the wild in all the oceans of the world. Um, one of the people we've had on this broadcast is Christina Zanotto, who her whole presentation is about swimming with sharks and her relationship with sharks. So do check that out too as a nice follow up if you're keen. Uh, what we're going to do now again, I'll bring up uh, Emily's website or social media. You can check that out. We're going to get you guys those videos in an email after this broadcast. So stay tuned for those as well. Um, but I want to just thank you so much, Emily, for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your stories with us. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you all for being interested in coral reefs and the ocean and our planet. Um, it's one of the most rare, coral reefs are some of the most remarkable places I've been, um, and I hope you find remarkable places on our planet that you love too. Awesome. And with that, Emily, I know it's your first broadcast. So what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teachers and groups. If you guys want to join me, uh, Mr. Breeze, Mr. Patrick, Mr. H, Mr. Armstrong, Miss Hopkins, just join me and say a big thank you and goodbye. Thank you guys for joining today.